Hello and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. My name is Scott Barker and uh, I will be moderating this discussion. Uh, we got a cool Q&A lined up with my man, Kevin Dorsey. And uh, Kevin has just texted me. He is running a little bit late, so I do apologize. Um, we'll probably get started in about two, three minutes or so. So if you want to just put it on mute, send a few prospecting emails, you know, get your calendar in order, do whatever you got to do, but we'll be kicking off very shortly. Um, and yeah, in the meantime, if uh, anyone has any questions for me, we can do a quick AMA, ask me anything uh, before Kevin gets here um, if you want. So feel free to go in the Q&A, uh, say your name, title, where you work. If you got any questions related to sales, marketing, whatever, let me know. I'll do my best to answer them until our, uh, our guest shows up. Thanks, y'all. There he is. Boom. Woo. You made it. <laughs> Literally sprinting from the meeting. Don't, don't let them tell you being a VP is just sitting looking at dashboards, man. Holy cow. <laughs> oh, made it. How'd the meeting go? You know, it could have gone better. Uh, you know, <laughs> I love the honesty, man. You know, it, dude, you know my style, right? Like, and you know, I know we have a different opportunity. But like, it's those, like, as you grow in your career, as you grow up the levels, like learning how to work with and communicate with different organizations is a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Sales will always think differently than finance, which will think differently than product, right? And one of the big things to be successful as you move up, especially as a VP, is learning how to work with all the parties. Right. What happens is work up in sales. You're used to sales. You think yeah, sales, yeah, of course. Talk sales. Why doesn't everyone think the way that we do? And it's learning how to to navigate that. So that can be a challenge sometimes, especially as companies get bigger. So you navigate yeah. it, you figure it out and you go from there. Absolutely. So th was this an internal meeting? So you're talking to other departments within the organization. And yeah, everyone's got their own things they are going on. Um, cool, man. Well, Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is always the best. Um, basically, we, we get to hang out and catch up. Uh, it's just live, and there's a bunch of people here uh, hanging out with us. So it's good to see you, man. I feel like it's been uh, been too long. So way yeah. too long, man. Let's stop this. Let's stop it. Let's stop it. All right. So what we're talking about today is the must-know do's and don'ts of amazing sales demos. I think we can probably broaden it to sales demos, sales calls, we'll, we'll get into to everything because I know not everyone with us is in, you know, SaaS, but that's probably where we'll spend most of our, our time. But before we get there, my man, uh, for those people that maybe live uh, in a little cave somewhere uh, and don't know the man, the myth, the legend that is Kevin Dorsey, where'd you come from? Who are you? What are you doing, man? So Kevin Dorsey, VP of Inside Sales at Patient Pop here in Santa Monica. Um, where I came from, man, like, you know, born and raised West Coast, went back and forth between LA and Wisconsin quite a bit. I'm a UW Badger for um, college. Um, got into sales in college, started selling knockoff Cutco knives, door to door, insurance, multi-level marketing, XM radios, if people remember what those are. Um, got into personal training sales, then equipment sales, and I've kind of worked my way up over the past, you know, decade or so to where I am now. And I guess as a leader of salespeople, I'm a big believer in coaching, big believer in training. And I really try to focus on the person in salesperson, not the sales in salesperson. I have this weird thought that if we make people better people, they'll also be better salespeople. So a lot of focus around that and mindset and habits and coaching and things like that. And so that's, that's who I am, man. I love it. And also add, add to that is the new tagline, which I think I'm going to, I'm going to make a thing is the sales philosopher. Almost said got... it. Almost said it. <laughs> Dude, it's a thing, man. I'm not letting that go. Uh, un, unpromoted. You know me, man. That's, that's, that's going to stick now. And so sales philosopher, let's talk a little bit about that one. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your recent lion post. Run me through it. I thought it was really cool. So um, 
made a post and you know bringing some philosophy into this thing we called sales and the idea was if a lion has always had a thorn in its paw does it hurt right and this idea in philosophy is like perception and reality if it's always been there and you know no different does it actually hurt right and the one of the beliefs in philosophy is the answer is no because it's always been there you know no different pain is an acute feeling pain is something new but if it's always been there you just adapt to it you learn to limp and you just think that's how i walk is i limp and how i was pulling that over into sales was a lot of times with closing and prospecting your prospect is the lion they've always done it a certain way they don't know it's wrong they don't know what's broken they don't know there's a new and better way to do it so when you ask these you know bland discovery questions you ask so how do you do this right now when they give you the answer they think their answer is right because that is their thorn it's on us as salespeople to make them aware of the thorn see a different future examples of other people that had the same thorn that they did and what the change led to right so that was the idea around the post is just because you know like this is old comic right that shows like someone getting ready to go to war right? And it's like an old medieval king and they got their swords and stuff. And he's coming out of the tent. He says, I can't talk to the salesperson. I'm too busy fighting a war. And the salesperson is there with like a Gatling gun, right? And so if he had been willing to take the time to look, he could have bought something that was better, but he knows no different. Swords are how he went to battle, right? So the education is where salespeople need to really step up. Education and awareness of the thorn, not of the better future. The thorn is what you have to educate around. Yeah, I love that. I thought that was uh, a really good post you did. It kind of reminds me of, uh, what's it called? Uh, the, uh, the idea of learned helplessness. Have you ever heard of this? Uh, this the, the, this uh, gentleman, I think his name was Martin, uh, Martin Seligman. He did this like experiment with dogs where yeah. put them in a room. Poor dogs, I know. This was like a long time ago. I don't like the ethics of this experiment, but it was a long time ago. Things were different back then. And he basically shocked the ground of the floor that these dogs were on. And in one control group, if they went to a certain part of the room, there was like a lever and they could stop it. The other control group didn't have a way to stop it. So eventually when the floor shocked, they just like lie down and they're, they're helpless. And then even when you put them into the room where they can stop this shock, they have learned that they cannot control their environment. So they'll just, just go down. So it's a super interesting experiment for people to check out. But anyway, we're not here to talk philosophy and, uh, and psychology. We're here to talk about demos. So let's dive into it, man. What's in your eyes, let's start at, at what I see at the beginning. What's the anatomy or structure of a good sales demo or sales call? So I'll start with the, the demo. Um, there's problem-based discovery, educate, demonstrate, buy-in, close. That is the structure of a demo, but each one of those is its own segment, right? So discovery never stops, right? Most people do discovery at the beginning and then it never stops. Like, and that's it. That's the last time they ask questions other than, does that make sense? So discovery, the first session, it needs to be problem-based discovery. So one of my rules with demos is don't ask a question you're not going to use to close. So if you're just asking questions to ask them, it's not worth it. So you're trying to discover the problem in the discovery. Then feature by feature, educate, demonstrate, buy in and close. So you're, and we might, this might be where this conversation goes, but that's the structure to me. Problem-based discovery, educate, demonstrate, buy in, close, feature by feature. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you, you said something that, that I agree with, that discovery never stops. Uh, you have to be going through the whole time, you know, asking thoughtful questions when it makes sense. Are you a believer, though, in more discovery up front? Because I've always been of the school, if you can get more discovery up front, it's going to actually help you guide the discussion better. You become a better guide as you go. So it's, it's defining more, right? More in terms of volume or more in terms of insight? Right. Mm -hmm. I want more insight in discovery, but having a 20 question discovery that you're taking someone through, it doesn't work. Right. Cause here's what people forget. 
okay? Most sales reps, unfortunately, you've never been sold to. You don't know what it's, I'm on a demo to see what the fuck you do. And so when you're taking 15 to 20 minutes asking me questions that only benefit you and not me, that's when the prospect gets antsy, right? So save some of those questions for later in the process. That's why I believe it continues to go. So yes, I want good discovery, but I guess I hesitate to say more because then what people turn that into is just more questions versus more insight. You can learn a lot very quickly in discovery. Oh, you get like to know that you should even keep the conversation going and then take your other discovery questions and continue them through the demo. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah, of course. No one wants to have that feeling and you know, I've been a buyer, you've been a buyer. It's awful when it feels like 21 questions and you're like going through a checklist. I mm -hmm. think, I think when you're asking more questions, cause you said like, you know, more in the sense of insight versus more for the sake of more and how you get more insight in my mind is asking uh, questions that build on top of each other. Right? So when they give you an answer, you know, peel that answer, uh, peel the onion, so to speak, right? Like go, go deeper on that answer. Don't just, jump around to another question. And what with that though, what I encourage my reps to do and we coach to is get the second layer answer, save the third layer for when you're covering the portion of your product that addresses it, right? Mm, nice. So earlier you told me this, which was leading to this, but this made me curious. Now that you're seeing this, how do you think about this? right? It's what keeps the demo engaging versus getting it all the way up. Because you got to remember as a buyer, I don't know why you're asking me these questions. You're hoping that I connect the dots. You're hoping that I gave you this answer. And then 17 minutes later, I remember, oh yeah, he asked me about this. This must apply to them. That's giving me way too much pressure as the buyer. You need to educate me throughout the process. I like that. I like that. That's a good tactical tip to make it more engaging, which is arguably one of the hardest things to do is keep someone engaged just depending on how long your demo is that's a, actually a good question because i see demos actually getting shorter which i'm a fan of what do you think is kind of optimal of course there's nuances there's very complex products but if you had to give an average how long do you think a demo should be 45 to an hour right yeah like, that's as long as human attention span works like, mm -hmm. like it just does. You can't pay attention for much longer than that. I don't believe sales reps can maintain focus for much longer than that, right? So I like 45 minutes to an hour. I know there's more complex products, but then it's multiple one hour, right? Because here's yeah. what happens for those of you running super long demos. Because it's so technical, by the time you get into the technicals, they forgot about the problem they were trying to solve. Totally. Now you're getting into the technicalities and they forgot why they're even talking in the first place. Right? So, you know, yeah. the classic ABC always be closing. I don't believe in always be closing. I believe in ABS always be selling. And a lot of salespeople, especially in enterprise, like the longer sales cycle, stop selling after the first demo. They are answering yeah. questions. They're explaining, but they stopped selling. They stopped bringing the result to the problem and reminding people why they're even talking about it. So six months later, you wonder why the deal stalled out. Well, it's because the last yeah. four months we've just been talking about integrations. Yeah. Like, yeah. Totally, man. So we do, so on Sales Hack, we actually launched this uh, uh, video series called Demolitions. So myself and uh, Dave Kennett is the CEO of a company called Replays. It's like a, a digital on-demand coaching platform. We actually uh, critique live demos that people send us. We were just doing one and we went through this whole demo and at the end, it was, I couldn't figure out like, cause the guy was very polished. He was, everything sounded good. And then I realized it was like, that was like an onboarding discussion. Like he got so heavy into the details that he wasn't selling. He was just showing everything it could do. And although it sounded nice, you didn't, it was like he was doing a, I, like a demonstration, but there was no selling component to it. He was just going line by line through every single thing that he did. And, you know, you forget that your job is to focus on the problems and the challenges and how it's going to help their, their business, not just show them. That's a big one that I actually talked about this um, a couple of years ago at a, at a conference was 
Stop selling your entire product. Yes. You lose deals over shit the prospect didn't care about. Mm-hmm. They didn't care about feature number seven, but they didn't like it. And because they didn't yeah. like it. You, you made know, them care about it. You yeah. made them aware of it. They're like, ooh, I don't like that. Mm-mm. And yeah. you, like they were sold, like people buy for two to three reasons tops and they justify with two more. No one buys for 13 yes. reasons. So if your product does yep. 13 things, figure out the three to four they care about and the two to three that they'll actually justify the purchase for. Yeah. No, no, that's also why and, I like demos. I don't need it all. Yep. I don't. Yeah. That's why beginner's luck is a thing uh, with some AEs because they only know like the two problems and they just stay there and they're just like, and they don't overcomplicate it and make it too complex. My, my reps, like now, now they laugh about it, but they know if they ever come talk to me about a deal, ever, they know the first question I'm going to ask them because it's the same every single time. What problem did they agree they had? What mm-hmm. problem did they agree they had? Because I don't want to talk to you about a deal that the prospect hasn't agreed upon a problem. Because if they haven't agreed that there's a problem, there's nothing to talk about. That deal is going to stall out. And people get these two things confused. There's a difference between a problem and a want. Big difference. Big, big difference. So talk about like deadly sins of prospecting and demoing. This is one. Yeah. The promise of more, what people want doesn't drive behavior. And if you need any example in this world, talk to everyone you talk to, me, and say, do you want more money? What will they say? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to lose <laughs> Yes. Do you want a more fulfilling relationship? Yes. Do you want a higher paying job? Yes. Do you want to travel? Yes. Do you, like, they want things. That follow-up question, what are you doing to achieve it? Nothing. It's not until we have problems generally that we actually change our behavior. There's a big difference between wanting more money and not having enough money. Right. Yes. So back like how we do it here, right? Are you not seeing enough patients or do you want more patients? Most people will say, Oh, I want more patients. That is not a problem. Not seeing enough patients is a problem. And now we can navigate that entire stream. Get the problem, yeah. not the want. Like that's, that's one thing is people sell on more. We'll get you more demos, more revenue, more time, more whatever. No, people don't change behavior for wants and more. They change behavior over problems in the now, not pain, problem. Whoever before people, Oh, no pain, no gain. Those are problems, not pain based yeah. stuff. You got about that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Write that down. So, you know, focus on the problem, not the want. That's a really good thing to always have in your mind. Okay. Let's let, the community drive here for a second. We got some good questions coming up. Thank you, everyone, for the, the good engagement here and thoughtful questions. Here's one, um, and it's it's very much in line with what we we're just talking about. How do you keep a customer who is more technical and granular from diving into the weeds? How do you keep the demo problem focused? So it's not necessary that you keep them out of the weeds. You explain how those weeds solve the problem, right? So if they're asking very technical questions, you have to pull it back to how it solves the problem, right? So, but then if you have someone that's going way, way too deep, as the salesperson, if you're truly being a consultative salesperson, that is when you put the brakes up and you say, hey, now I can walk you through this, but it doesn't have much to do with what we're actually trying to solve. And I wouldn't want to lose sight of that. Mm-hmm. that's you being an expert. That's you being a consultant saying, Hey, I'd love to show you that. How do you think that affects the problem we're trying to solve? There's your question, right? Oh, you want to see how triple deep the API integration and speed algorithm works, man. Like that's crazy. Like how do you think that applies to the problem we're trying to solve? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it probably doesn't. I'm just curious. All right, cool. I'll show it to you real quick. And then you get, back, right? So you can go to the weed, but show them why you're in the weeds together. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I was always asking the why. Like, yeah, absolutely. We can get there. Why does that actually matter to you though? Is it, it's not exactly focused on this, this problem. Okay. There we go. The, you have to bring it back because if you just ask someone why they're focused on it or why they care, like it's kind of an offensive question. If you really think about it, right? 
if we were hanging out and you're like, you know what I want to do? I want to go on a trip to Peru and find myself. Right. <laughs> Why? Why do you want to do that? Right. Like, dude, like, cause I want to do that. Right. So if you reverse it to the problem is like, ah, like, how is that playing into some of the stress you've had lately? Or how is that playing into what we were just talking about? That's the difference, right? If you just ask them why, it's because they care. They care. It's asking, how do you think that applies to the problem we're trying to solve? Big difference in the question. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, all right. Another good question. Sam, Stefan, thank you for the question. So Sam is um, pushing back on the fact that 45 minutes seems long especially if focused on maybe two to three features or problems for the customer. Have you explored or ever A-B tested shorter first demos? Uh, Sam says, ours are 20 minutes on the calendar. So I don't like 20 because I think 20 is too short on the calendar, right? Because I don't believe it leaves a lot of room for like my previous setup where I said educate, demonstrate, buy-in. So if you're covering even three features and you're educating, Educating on why it even matters, demonstrating how the product works, getting buy-in around that education and the product, and then closing that you can move forward, that takes about 10 minutes, right? So yeah. three features puts you in that 30-minute range, add in discovery and add up navigating the end of the call for next steps. That's why I like 45. They don't all have to be right? There's difference in product. There's difference on inbound and outbound, right? There's a difference when someone says, Hey, I'm looking to buy cool. What package, <laughs> you know, like, so it varies, but if you're doing the right type of demo, I think 45 minutes is like the sweet spot, right? That's just the sweet spot. You can close some faster. There's other ones where you get a chatty Kathy and they'll take you on for an hour, but that's, that's what I like is a sweet spot. So we do, we have demos that close in 20 minutes. We also have demos that got three hours long. The difference in the, Who's determining that demo's going so long? It's not us. It's the prospect. Then I'm okay with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm a fan of shorter, shorter demos if possible. But, you know, I think, like you said, it's all based on your product. I would do your own internal A-B testing. Kevin, you know, KD's A-B testing at Patient Pop is going to be different than your A-B testing. So give it a, give it a go. Um, Here's another great question. They just keep coming, man. So I'm going to let them drive. Why not? <laughs> uh, so we got one from Nelson. This is kind of jumping now to the, the end of a demo. And we all know how important next steps are. And Nelson wants to know, what are some ways that reps can ensure next steps are agreed on and happen during a demo rather than leaving it open-ended? So a, a few ways here. Um, one is actually asking for agreement. So Salespeople love to turn questions into statements. Okay, watch how this works. If at the end of the call, you're supposed to say, hey, so can we hop on a call next Tuesday? That's what the question is supposed to be, and you make them answer. What a lot of reps will do is like, great, well, I'll follow up with you next Tuesday at one o'clock. I'll send over that email for you, and I'm really looking forward to it. Have a great day. Now, we feel like next steps were agreed upon, but a very important thing is missing. They didn't fucking agree, right? So the first part is actually asking, right? Actually ask for next steps. The second part of this, though, is making sure that it makes sense. So when I said earlier about buy-in, this is the big part, right? So, hey, before we talk next steps, do you agree that blank, will help you solve blank a little bit better than what you're doing right now? Because if not, we don't need to talk next steps. So notice I'm bringing the problem back up even before I discuss next steps. And if they say, yeah, like I think, I think this can help us solve this. Cool, what stood out to you the most? What stood out to you the most? Like what really was top of mind for you? Oh, I really thought this was cool. Awesome, well the next best steps are to get you, me, and your boss on the line. When can we make that happen? Right, so it's using the problems you got before at the end of the call, but actually asking them and getting agreement. So this is how we end our calls. Problem agreements, next step agreements, commitment. So we agree there's a problem worth continuing discussing. All right, cool, so the next steps are, you gotta talk to your team. Can we meet back up on Tuesday at one? Yes, great, I'm going to send a calendar invite. Can you accept that for me? 
Yes. Great. I'm going to put my stuff together. You agreed you're going to handle this. Hey, I know stuff pops up all the time, but like, I'm going to clear my calendar for this. Could you give your best effort to be there for me next week? Yes. I've gotten three commitments to that. And now what do you think goes in the follow-up email? I really appreciate your commitment to making this time. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And like, ideally, I, a way you can judge how bought in someone is too. When you get to that problem agreement, if you do that really well, guess who's asking for the next steps? It's not you. It's right. them. Yeah. It's them saying, hey, let's meet next week. I'll, I'll bring my boss. And then you're like, okay, here we go. So we, um, we practice something here called the hard yes. It has mm -hmm. to be a hard yes. If you ask that question, so hey, before we talk next steps, what do you think? Does this look like it'll help you solve X, Y, Z a little bit better than you're doing right now? Yeah, I think so. Oh, oh that's, that's not a hard yes. That's a soft yes. Mm -mm. Or they'll do a deflection, right? They'll say like, do you think this will solve X, Y, Z better than what you're doing right now? And they go, well, how much does it cost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a deflection. They didn't answer yeah. the question. You have to come back and say, well, hold up. Like before we talk price, do you even think this is going to help you? Because if it's not going to help you, we don't need to talk price. Or is that why you're asking about price? You pull it back to the agreements there, right? But don't move on. If they haven't agreed it's going to solve a problem, gone. Yeah. 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 I love it. Um, all right. This is going um, a little bit into coaching. And you, you know, run a large team. So you're the perfect guy to answer this. All right. Kara has a question. How do you teach new AEs, the importance of discovery and layering, layering it into uh, the demo. So Kara's on board, she knows discovery is important, but how do you teach new sales reps how important it is? So it's, it's where we start our training, right? And this is where a lot of companies get it wrong is where do they start the training? They started around the product. So what do reps focus on? The product. It's where we start our training. Our first three training modules are all on discovery. Our call scorecard, the first section is discovery. The fields that we're entering into Salesforce come from discovery. What problem do they agree they're trying to solve comes from discovery. Like that, that's what we build. Actually, hold up. Do I have this here? One second. One. Oh, here we go. So our demo training binder, right? For our new reps. I don't know if people can see this. Probably not. What's the first tab? Discovery. And look how many sections we have on that. And then you go to our, where is our call scorecard? Where are we at? Overcoming objections. Scorecard, right? Demo scorecard. This is all discovery. The first page. Can y'all see this? The first full page of the scorecard is discovery. That's how. I think it was Karen or Kara. We build it into our training and it's what we ask most of our questions about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was perfect. I, I know a lot, a lot of, a lot of people are like, hey, man, how do I get my hands on that binder, man? Kate, Kate, someone's going to break in the patient pop and steal that binder, man. Worth millions. Yeah. I love it. Um, all right. There's, I think this is honestly, potentially the most questions we've ever gotten this at this stage <laughs> of a webinar. This is wild. There's, for those that you guys can't see it, but there's like probably 40 questions here. Uh, let's keep it going. Okay. So um, I like this one. This is a good one. Um, and I see this again, we did demolitions and we just reviewed this demo where this guy was so polished that it, in my eyes, it was a bad demo because it came off so salesy. This guy was way too polished. How do you help your reps come off as less salesy on the phone uh, when they're doing demos and more kind of conversational? Um, so truthfully, one, this comes down to hiring, right? Like we listen for tonality. When I do like phone screens and things like that, I'm just listening. When I do an interview with a rep, I rarely, like, for the first time, like, I don't look at them a lot. I just want to listen. What, do they have a natural tone when they talk, right? That's the first, is, like, hiring people that have the tone that you're looking for. Second is coaching to tone. Like, I've, I've talked about this before. Like, we have tonality built into our training. Lost in the city, Scooby-Doo, thank God, right? Like, we have tones that we talk about, and we actually practice it. 
we give feedback on tone, right? Because how it sounds matters so much. But the last part that I think it's overlooked a lot is repetition, okay? This is where most go wrong or they don't do it enough. Nothing sounds natural when you do it once. Nothing does. So for most AEs, right? Everyone here I think has heard like the 10,000 hour rule, right? Which has been, you know, butchered and bastardized for a while now. But let's call it the 10,000 hour rule. It takes 10,000 hours of purposeful practice to get mastered at something. If you're running two demos a day, every day for a year, how many do you get to? Two a day. All right, that's 40 a month by 12. We're talking about 480 in a year. That's why people don't sound natural. They've only done it 480 times. So that's where the practicing and the repetition comes in, right? If you know what to do, then you can make it your own. This is why people get so torn up on scripts and they're totally wrong. What does every amazing, actually not even every amazing, every actor use, every actor use in a movie? Script. They seem to do okay. They don't sound robotic. They don't come like, yeah. it's because they practice it over. And this is why movies take three years to create. People always see that one hour piece and they think, oh, like they just showed up and did that. They did hundreds of takes, thousands of script read throughs. Like that's what they do. Repetition. Do it more. You'll sound less salesy. Oh, and listen to your calls. Listen to your calls. And if you can't cringe, then you're good. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. And a lot of people think, you know, if I over practice, then I'm going to sound so scripted. No, once you, once you master it, then you can do the flair. Then you can do the nuances. Then you can layer in the personality, the jokes, the whatever it is that makes you you. Uh, I, I strongly agree there. Okay. Um, Chris uh, has a great question. So t Chris is having a problem with, after a very successful demo, his prospects are going dormant on him. He says, customer priorities constantly change depending on their work schedule. How do you keep your issue top of mind and a necessary problem to solve? So this is, we've all been there. Prospect has five different things they're trying to solve for. You're maybe third on the list. How do you get up to number one? So first you have to remember you might not be able to. I, it, it's just remembering that, right? Like you might not be able to be priority number one. Shit, I was almost missed this webinar because of a higher priority item, right? You may not get to priority number one. And in fact, rarely will you be. But this is a great, this is a classic question of like an end result with skipping everything beforehand. You might find you get ghosted less if you do proper problem-based discovery. And you'll get ghosted less if you do educate, demonstrate, buy and closing. And you'll get ghosted less if you end the call. I said about how to end the call. Problem agreements, next steps agreements, and commitments, right? But then the last part, most sales rep follow-up sucks. I'm going to get close. It sucks. And you know how it sucks is because I get it, okay? Guess what's missing from most sales rep follow-ups? The problem. That's missing. So I can't remember who asked it. Go read all your follow-ups and see how often you mention the problem they're trying to solve. Because if all you're talking about are the benefits of your product, or if all you're talking about is what you covered in the demo, and there's no problem, that's why it's not top of mind is because you stopped talking about the problem. Our follow-up deck, the first five slides are the problem they agreed to. The first sentence of the follow-up emails, I'm so glad we were able to talk about this problem that you're facing. And I know you don't want any more time to go by doing it. Someone ghosts us. It's been four weeks and I'm worried that you're still dealing with the same problem you had four weeks ago. Someone doesn't close the deal six months later. Hey, I looked you up. It looks like you're still having the same problem we talked about six months ago. Something's got to change. That's, that's what you have to do. Most sales reps don't put the problem in the follow-up. They put the product in the follow-up, and that's the problem. Yeah, absolutely. And even worse than that, sometimes you just, it, you don't put the problem, you don't even put the features, you just do the, all the action items, right, that they, they ask you for, and then it, that's it. And it's just like, here's the action items, and that's how you quickly become a gopher and not a salesperson. You're just running around, you know, and then they'll come back, and they have more questions, and then you run and go find the answers, and you're not, being that consultant that's guiding them, they're guiding you. Um, all right, so here's another one. So many, this is going crazy. So we, we, we have about like probably 10 more minutes or so. If 
you have more questions for KD, find this man all over LinkedIn. Um, go connect with him, and we'll, we'll keep it going. But we'll do our best to keep this going. Um, okay, I like this one. Um, do you recommend giving a prospect a free trial? What are your thoughts on free trials? Pro? I'm very pro if you help them use it the right way. The problem with most free trials is you give it to me and expect me to figure out how to use it. You expect me to figure it out. I wouldn't do that, right? If you have a product that they can actually use and see the results of, I'm a big believer in free trials. I think people should do it more. It's not fair. It's not fair, all right? I run a 200-person sales org, which means my contracts are on the multiple six figures now, which actually sucks as a buyer, right? Because now I've got to get approval for $100,000, not $30,000. And I don't even get to try it. I, I get to test drive a fucking car. Like, I get to walk through an apartment to see if I want it. I even get to sample snacks at the grocery store. But this $200,000 product. Shout out Costco. <laughs> Costco. Right? But this $200,000 software product that you told me was going to revolutionize my team, I don't even get to try. I get to see. So I do believe, I think more companies should do it because if your product is that fucking good, prove it, right? Like actually prove it. Cause this is where you and I talked about this a little bit where I believe sales is going is more into the how, not the what and the why. Okay. We know what it is. We know why we should do it. It's the how can I envision the how of it allowing me to use it. Let's me see how give me a few trials, right? For people coming after me, if you gave me 10 free seats and let it run for six months, do you think you might have a higher chance of closing me? Just, Throwing it out there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I believe in it full heartedly. Yeah. Yeah. I strongly agree with your, your idea of the how. I think the how is going to become so, so important. And the, you know, all of us in SaaS, the, the service part got forgotten about building mm -hmm. all these products and the features and like the service part, I think 2020 and beyond will, we'll see that, right? Like, I would almost rather have less seats of a piece of software and have them firing at all cylinders because you showed me how versus more that I have no idea how to operate. And that, that's what's missing most. And this is not, this is not a knock on CS. This is not what I'm saying. It's just how the orgs have been built. CS people should be experts on how to use the product, right? So like outreach or sales law, CS should know how to write the best cadences and sequences in the world. CS should know how yes. to CS should know how to write great emails. CS should know how yeah. to leverage and create the cadences and sequences. CS should be able to say, hey, you're, you don't have a no-show follow-up sequence? Oh my God, like, let me build that for you real quick. You have, like, that's what CS should be doing. And it's not, yeah. right? That, yeah. that has to be a shift in the future. It just has to. Totally, absolutely. Uh, we're on the same page there. Uh, this is also an interesting question. Brett, thank you for the question, man. Uh, in your sales motion, uh, do you have or encourage separate demos for different stakeholders? So do you have different persona demos? I think it's a good question. So I say yes and no. And a lot of my old reps know that was a phrase, favorite phrase of mine. Yes and no. <laughs> so yes, I do believe you have to have different questions for different personas. Um, but this was a very interesting study that came out of the Challenger customer. If you haven't read Challenger customer yet, go read it. Um, it's better than the Challenger sale because it actually gets more into the how. Most, but again, back to the how. Most people actually haven't read Challenger Sale, first of all, and then second, they don't apply it at all. Everyone forgot that yeah. Challenger was supposed to be education, and no one's educated. Yeah. All y'all Challenger sellers, yeah. not doing it. But the Challenger- yeah. People think Challenger is just like being aggressive and being like, yeah, if you ask people to actually break down I Challenger. Think but... the, eggs thing, the book wouldn't have sold as well if it was called something else, but it made people think being a challenger sale was something different because of the title. I think it turned some people away that aren't comfortable with challenging and it made other people get away with saying, Oh yeah, I read it. You know, you got to challenge the status quo, challenge their way of thinking. You got to no, no, that's not what it is. Anyway, I digress back to it. The challenger customer, what they found, and this changed the way that I teach. We were taught, you know, you demo finance for finance reasons and sales for sales reasons and marketing for marketing. But what they found 
was that's why a lot of deals stall out because there's not one reason for everyone to buy. And so the only thing people can agree upon is price. And that's what drives pricing way down. So what they talk about is you need a unifying account problem. Finance, here's why I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you because of this problem in sales. Because if you try to sell finance for finance reasons and they don't like it, it kills the deal. So you need to navigate it well, but you need to bring it back to the unifying problem that is trying to be solved by the product. I hope that makes sense. Like we don't have a lot of time. Go read Challenger Customer, but it talks about this. So should you ask them finance-based questions? Yes. Should you show how it applies to their world? Yes. But you got to bring it back to the original problem you're trying to solve. Right? So we do have personas and we do have different questions we ask them. We do have different things our product does for them. We always try to bring it back to the unifying problem that's trying to be solved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. So what I'm hearing there is like, find the unifying problem. It's okay to speak to that problem through their lens, right? You'll have different lenses, but you're always bringing it back to the, to the same one. I tell you, it kind of, if, you, if you're solving for different problems, like you said, it just opens up more doors for issues right if one of those problems doesn't stick it can blow up your whole deal right yeah um here's a good one salman uh is you know struggling with the the old commercial part when money gets brought into the picture um always a bit of a a scary part for a lot of aes is it a good idea to present the proposal uh aka the money part right after the demo or should you come back and send a proposal over email. So the first time they see pricing over email? Yeah, basically like, should you discuss commercials at the end of the demo and walk them through, you know, here's how much we're thinking it's gonna cost, or should you go back, regroup, make a proposal, send it over email? So first time they're seeing price. They should always hear price from you. Never from an email, never from a proposal. If that's the first time they're seeing price, it's going to set up a lot of issues because you're not there to justify it, right? So I'm not saying you have to cover it on the first call, but the next step should be an agreed upon time to go through the proposal together and then they get it. You should never send pricing without your ability to converse around it because you don't know what their reaction is going to be, and that justification needs to be there. Why it's worth it on the problem. That's the other part of most proposals. We talked about this earlier. The price is never pulled back to the problem. It's pulled back to what they're gonna get. 15 seats, integration, customer support, this blue button, that red one, nothing back to the problem. This part right here is gonna solve this problem, and this part here is gonna solve that problem. This part here is gonna solve that problem. This is what it costs and why it's worth it to you. So always talk price, always. Now that, like that first time they see price should always be something like this. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's, you know, think of you're dealing with a, a significant other or something. You gotta tell them some bad news, you know? Do you wanna send it via email so you have, no, they can, like misconstrue it all certain ways, or do you want to see there and be able to see their reaction and and uh, go accordingly, right? You don't want to send a, it's a black box if you're sending it an email. Um, okay, we probably have time for about one more question here. Let me find the best one. And again, go follow KD on LinkedIn. He's super helpful, always posting good stuff. So a lot of your questions will be answered from his posts. And uh, check out, if this is interesting, also check out our new uh, video series, Demolitions. We do this, but like in real time. Ooh, this is, I like this one. Um, how do you treat uh, multi-person demos differently than 1v1? This is a good one. Okay. What's that? Um, I find my domino. I find okay. my domino, okay? What I mean by that is who is the one in that room if you get to fall everyone else follows nice right. i love it find your domino now how do you how do you identify the domino thank you scott great <laughs> it's almost like i do this all the time <laughs> okay. this is where most sales reps don't take their jobs seriously 
if you know you have a multi-person demo coming up, call in ahead of time and find out, okay? Find out, okay? Like if you're meeting with five people, okay? Your point of, because very rarely is the first demo with a lot of people, very rarely. But even if it is, it came from one person. I've yet to have five people inbound from the same company at the same time saying we all need to meet. One person came in. The meeting was set with one person and they pulled everyone else in. You ask that person, hey Scott, who's the domino? Who's, who's the person that's really gonna be driving this conversation, right? You find it out ahead of time, right? Do your research, find out. Because a lot of times in demos, if it's me and all my managers, guess what I'm doing during that demo? I'm very quiet. I'm very quiet. I'm letting my managers run most of it because it matters to them, right? But who's the domino? You might be banging out emails, you know, you're, you're, trying, you know, you're doing your I'm, thing. I'm the domino but I won't be engaged because the managers are engaging. So they're like, oh, I'm gonna do all that. Find your domino, make sure you engage them. I really like that. That also gives you a chance to, you know, start collaborating with your champion a little bit. Once you're, you're like, hey, like, we're, we're doing this together. Let's like win over so-and-so. And then, you know, that bond starts to form when you, when you make those small asks of someone. When, I think Nelson asked it earlier about like navigating the next steps, right? If the first demo, right, went well, and the next step is the multi-demo, you, you get to say, I'm like, well, hey, Scott, I know you want this. The best way to make this happen for you is we gotta get this domino to fall. Who's the domino? Who's the one that if we can team up on, like, we can make this happen for you and your team? Now it's empowering. I'm trying to get it done for you, not for someone else, right? So leverage your champion, right? Treat them like a champion. Yeah, love it. Okay, I'm gonna sneak one more in. I know you're busy, you probably got a, a 12 to prep for, but all right, we'll do a quick one. Okay, how many case studies and customer stories do you reference in your demo? Obviously super important. Is it the more the better, or is there a point that the prospect thinks it's just disingenuous and you're just throwing too many? So it, it's only disingenuous if it doesn't apply to their world. If I have a 200 person sales team and you're showing me a case study of a five person sales team, I don't care. If I have a five person sales team and you're showing me what Salesforce did, I don't care, right? So the case studies need to be applied to my world, right? Now, little, little psychological trick for all y'all that tuned in on this, put customer quotes throughout your demo. Put customer quotes throughout your demo. Never reference them, never say anything about them, but at the bottom of every slide, have a customer saying something good about you, right? Because here's what happens. The prospect reads it. Whose voice are they hearing it in? Their own, right? So having those little things, right, sprinkled throughout is big. But here's one that we, we do, right, is you overwhelm with proof, okay? Here's what we'll end with. So I had marketing make proof cards for me. These are proof cards. And what I have here, name of the practice, the problem they were dealing with, I know it's small, the problem they were dealing with, how we solved it, and what the results were. So when I talked about like case studies that matter, this is how. So now when we're about to go into price, and I can say, look, do you believe this will solve the problems better than X, Y, Z? Yes, I do. What stood out to you? This and this. Cool. Well, before we talk price, I want you to know that it's not just you. This worked for them, and for them, and for them, and for them. At that point, you actually do want them going, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. Show me the price, right? If you're overwhelmed with like cool shit, they're down for it. Love it. Well, that is an excellent place to wrap up truth cards. Bring in new things. Get rid of the case studies, man. We're talking truth cards. I like it. I like it. And you, I assume you break those up by company size, industry, that sort of thing. So you have different different truth cards. So we, have, we have both, right? We have it specific, but also like, especially for us, like an SMB, like when you can see a hundred examples of it working, uh, like that gives you confidence, right? Like people forget how scary it is to buy for all you trying to sell to me. You know how scary it is for me to ask finance for $250,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know how frightening it is to get it wrong. 
Do you know what it's like to roll out a $150,000 purchase and have nothing change or have low adoption? Like that's scary. This makes me feel better. Like, hey, other people went through this. Okay, I, I, can, I think I can do this, right? And then back to the CS, if you told me I could talk to all of them, oh, okay, to talk about the how. You and I have talked about this at length, right? Yeah. See, talk to Katie about how he uses cadences and sequences. Oh, okay, right? That's what you're going for, yeah. is security to buy. Totally. Yeah, I did a post on this the other day. You'll win more deals mitigating risk than adding value in my eyes. Mm. That's it. That's it. Mm. Boom. We're doing it. I'm actually, yeah, I'm doing a podcast on that soon with my boy, Chris Donato. Anyway, KD, always a pleasure, man. Uh, I feel like we'll have to catch up online, uh, catch up offline this as well. Bad. But Jesus, this was, man. <laughs> I had a whole like plan for how this was going to go. And the community's like, nah, man, we got, we got shit we need to deal with now. Um, so thank you all for the great engagement. That was a lot of fun. Super insightful, man. And uh, go follow this guy and check out Demolition's video series. Appreciate y'all. Have a great week. Peace. Peace.